you know, we just pick them, you know. I mean, we don't, you know, we don't shoot the hens. You know, we only shoot drakes. Looks like a hen for a lucky day. You know, we try to work that conservation aspect of it, you know, and just focus on your easy shots, you know, don't take these long, crazy, you know, 35, 45 yard shots, nice and tight, the decoys, and there's no reason for any sky busting, not when you have them, you know, working the way they work out here. We've got a lot of hunting sports in the, in the industry, but I think your waterfowlers and your duck hunters, there's a common bond there. You know, there's a common love and a common interest that they share, and it goes deep, you know. You know, when those guys get their first Harley, when they get their first Skoda, they get their first common golden eye, that's a special moment, you know, and to be able to share that with somebody is, you know, it's important knowing that you contributed to that. There are people in this world that go looking for adventure, and then there are those that live it every day. Alaska Outdoors Television. Experience Alaska like never before. You know, if you're coming to Alaska and you're interested in waterfowl hunting up here, uh, make sure you do your research. That's probably one of the key things I could tell is a lot of people come up and they want to just dive into it. You know, we get hit up all the time and we get a lot of interest and a lot of emails and a lot of phone calls on people saying, I just got to Alaska as a week to duck season. You know, I've got all my gear and I want to go. but you know, Alaska will kill you duck hunting just as easy as it will moose hunting, sheep hunting, goat hunting, or anything like that. And you've got to make sure that you've got all the safety parameters put in place, you've got logistics taken care of, and you've got your communication taken care of. That's nice, isn't it? Yeah, that's like glass. What are you thinking? Same thing as last time? Yeah, let's try that. I think that that will be the best opportunity for getting some good footage right there. We know how the birds work. Yeah. Randy and I have been friends for about four years. We, you know, hunted sea ducks, you know, for the last three or four years together. And, you know, we always take the time to get out and enjoy that sport together. He has a passion for waterfowl as well as I do. Randy has a nice boat, he's got a nice system. I've got the decoys, I've got the knowledge. We combine those two, and you know, every time we go, we have a great time. Oh, look at that rapid duck just got up. Look at that, oh man, holy cow. Well, we had the opportunity to go out of Whittier, Alaska, where there is a large variety of common golden eyes and Barrow's golden eyes as well as an opportunity to harvest some of your more bucket list birds, if you will. You have your harlequin, your common scoters, your surf scoters, and your white wing scoters. On this day, we had an excellent opportunity to go out, um, set up in one of the local bays that's pretty close. You know, we, we got in, we got set up. Um, you know, we set up probably 20 to 30 um, golden eye decoys on long lines and we had some surf scoter decoys out on the outside edge. You did a pretty good job on that paint job there. <laughs> Homemade. <laughs> I took a couple Godwall decoys and painted them as Harleys. Weekend project. <laughs> I think there might have been an adult beverage involved. <laughs> whoa, whoa, rock right rock, here. Huh? Rock, 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 rock. You know, today we've got the birds that are going to be coming um, probably from the ocean side and on the uh, Prince William Sound as well as back in the bay. Those Harleys look pretty good sitting there. They look great. These birds are going to transition back and forth. So we're set up in a pocket here where we're going to have the birds moving from right to left and we're going to have birds moving from, you know, left to right. So as any bird comes around this point, whether it's on the left side or the right side, the first thing they're going to see is these decoys. And when they see those decoys spread out on a long line with those little 10 yard gaps in between on the line there, that's the holes they want to fill. If we could pull that scoter line straight out, I think we'll be better. Yeah, we just don't want them so far out that they uh, we're shooting 50 yards. I'll just bring it out another 10 yards. As the tide goes out, we'll gain ground on them, so 
Absolutely. Okay, we're good. You know, and typically we do that. You know, we'll put three or four decoys and we'll leave about 10 yards on the long line before we place the next decoy. And that hole, that's where the birds are gonna target to. Yeah, that'll be better. Give them a spot to land in. We're still only in 10 feet of water. Yeah, now we got that nice S shape. And that's what we want. That looks better, much better. Give them that little S pattern. That way you got two pockets. You know, they want to be a part of that flock and they're going to come around the corner. They're going to see the decoys. They're going to lock up. They're going to come right in. You ready? Cedar and Skeeter. That's going to be a lot of fun today. You named your dog wrong. <laughs> Who's the oldest? How old is she? She will be nine. Yep, she wins. January. She's got a lot of energy, a lot of fire in her. It's because she sleeps all day long. She'll swim right up here to us. A pair of them. Dogs are key to waterfowl hunting here in Alaska because you're either walking a lot of the muskag type environments and things like that. If you have a very well trained dog or even if you have a dog that's not to that level yet, whether it's a senior hunter or a master hunter or even a started dog, it's important to have one. It's important to, to use that tool. If you can use that tool and utilize that resource to help you, it's so much more enjoyable. It makes the sport so much better. Plus, you get clean retrieves back. You're, you're losing less birds while you're using the dog. And that's what's important, too, is knowing that if you have a cripple and if he swims off into the grass or he swims off into the rocks, that dog is going to find that bird. And therefore, you don't have the waste you know, of losing that bird. Skeeter, fetch it up. Alaska is a huge uh, waterfowl wetland area up here which raises millions of rods every year. Uh, Minto Flats, which is probably one of the largest waterfowl refuge areas in Alaska up north near Fairbanks, is probably responsible for producing over a million birds a year. Perfect example. Look at that head. Look at the colors, the blue and the greens. Beautiful white crest, that bird is in full plumage. Full plumage. When those birds migrate through this region, they have a tendency to split off into two different flyways before they leave Alaska. Some of them come down through the Anchorage area. Some of them head further east over around Delta Junction. And we see a large variety of waterfowl, you know, that move through here. And probably the end of September to the uh, first two weeks of October. Well, Alaska Waterfowl Association, it's a local nonprofit organization um, dedicated to conservation restoration projects and, uh, you know, working with you know, Alaska Fish and Game and having the opportunity to help promote waterfowl hunting here in Alaska and at the same time take care of one of the resources that it has. Currently we're working with um, the USGS service. Uh, one of the local biologists is doing some trapping here to check for avian flu viruses here in Alaska. Alaska is a portal for the avian flu and we're concerned about the flu virus here in Alaska so we've been trapping birds with them locally. We're also working with Alaska Fish and Game on the uh, Palmer Hay Flats here on some projects um, dealing with some erosion issues that we're having out there. We're currently in the process of restoring a sea duck rockery with the Anchorage Museum of Natural Science. It's going to include around 12 to 16 birds, most of your sea ducks here in Alaska, you know, so we're very excited about that. 
don't get any easier than that. You know, we just pick them, you know? I mean, we don't, you know, we don't shoot the hens. You know, we only shoot drakes. You know, we try to work that conservation aspect of it, you know? And there's one right there. Kill it. Good shot. Good shot. Shoot it. Fetch. Just focus on your easy shots, you know? Don't take these long, crazy, you know, 35, 45 yard shots, nice and tight, the decoys and, you know, ethical kills, clean kills. And there's no reason for any sky busting, not when you have them, you know, working the way they work out here. There's no reason for that at all. It's not a huge sport here in Alaska, as you can imagine. Most people are hunting sheep, moose, deer, goats and stuff like that but the you know but the individuals that want to take the time to learn about it to get out and do it you've got a lot of public access you have a lot of public land to hunt in but logistics like any other aspect of hunting here in Alaska is important you know you've got to have the proper equipment you've got to have the proper boat you've got to have the proper motor you know and if you don't have that gear or the proper equipment it's gonna be very difficult to hunt waterfowl here in Alaska. So it's not as easy as it is down the lower 48, but it is doable. We're gonna pick one of these up. We're gonna take it in and have the biologist do a test on it and see if they can find out what's wrong with it. We've got so many murals out here that are dead floating in the water. Randy said he saw probably about, uh, I don't know, probably 30 to 40 last weekend. We've got at least a dozen here laying right around us. So we're gonna stop, pick one up. Here we go, there's one. Don't know what's wrong with them, don't know what's happening, but as you can see, there's quite a few out here laying around. There was a huge die-off this year with the MERS, and you know it was statewide. You know, I talked to Alaska um, Fish and Wildlife biologist about that on the way out this day. We had a, we found probably a dozen or two. You know, there was a raft of up to 50 that were floating dead, and we ended up finding out later that they were basically starving to death. There was a huge algae bloom this year, and that contributed to the death of their, you know, of their food source which is a small fish that inhabits those areas and you know it contributed to a huge die off. You know up here in Alaska we hunt a lot of deltas, marshes and things like that. You know sea duck hunting for example. You know we had the opportunity this year to go out and do some of that, but in the lower 48 they might be hunting flooded timber, they might be hunting flooded cornfields, you know fields and other types of environment like that. When up here we're hunting mostly brackish water, which is seawater and saltwater mixed type marshes and deltas. So it's a little bit different. The strategy is usually a little different when you're placing your decoys and you're setting things up versus, you know, in the lower 48 where it might be a blind or a permanent blind or something like that that's already established and you simply go out to that location and hunt your waterfowl. You know, I really think it goes deeper than that. You know, you've got a lot of hunting sports in the, in the industry, but I think your waterfowlers and your duck hunters, there's a common bond there. You know, there's a common love and a common interest that they share, and it goes deep, you know. And it's nice to be able to, you know, to educate other people on the sport, to be able to share that with them, and, you know, even get the youth involved. You know, it's a lot of fun. You know, when those guys get their first Harley, when they get their first Scoot or they get their first common golden eye. That's a special moment, you know, and to be able to share that with somebody is, you know, it's important knowing that you contributed to that. Yeah, it's beautiful, you know, to be able to sit out there and you got the snow-capped mountains in the background, the setting, you know, you can hear the loons off in the background sometimes. If you know you're going to see whales going out there, you're going to see sea lions, you're going to see sea otters, and to sit there on the shoreline and watch it all, you know, transpire there, it's pretty amazing. And to top it off, you have a great shoot.
hypothermia is another big thing, even with dogs. You know, a lot of people don't, you know, really take that in consideration. They load up the gear, they put on four or five jackets, they get out into the truck, the truck's warm, they get to the location they're hunting in, but they, you know, they don't take the time to really think about, you know, having the proper gear, make sure that you select the proper equipment for your dog, you know, whether it's a neoprene vest or something like that. I mean, I would not venture into Alaska without a neoprene vest on your dog, starting probably the first of October. Every dog that goes to waterfowl hunt should have that. Even though the dog's working hard, he's chasing down birds, there's a lot of time where he's also sitting on the front of your boat. He's sitting there waiting, you know, in anticipation. And, you know, it can be 20 degrees outside, that water temperature's below freezing. The dog spends five, 10 minutes trying to find a bird in the water, you know, on a retrieve, and his body temperature's dropping. And there's been a lot of dogs in the past that we've seen that actually got hypothermia out there, and we had to bring them in, cover them with the tarp, set up a jet boil or some type of heating source to warm the dog back up. It never seems to, to fail. You move to where the birds are working, they stop flying. It's a waiting game. You know, the tide plays a huge part in the sea duck hunts because of the areas that we hunt in. You know, we might go into a tidal area where it's where it's barren rock and it's barren ground. By the time we get in there, you know, we set the decoys on the shore, on rocks, on gravel. In six hours, that can be 15 to 20 foot deep, you know, so you've got to be able to compensate for your, you know, for your leads on your long lines and stuff like that, and your weights and your decoys and all of that. You know, it makes a huge part on the birds as well because the birds know when the tide's going out. When the tide's going out, that's when they're going to come in and feed. So it kind of shifts and you've got to make sure that you're, you know, that you're using all of those, you know, key indicators and making sure you're set up in the right location using the right gear. I've got to shoot that one again, Skeeter. He's a, he's a beast. He gets into beast mode, and if that duck dives, he's going to dive. I've seen him stick his whole head under the water to try to get a duck and to chase it. He does it in the grass. He will, you know, if a bird swims up into these reeds, he will get in those reeds, and he will hunt until either he can't find the bird or some, you know, some other type of, you know, environmental change has happened, whether he's picking up the other scent from the other birds and he loses track of it. But he'll hunt hard. Here at Goldeneye, here he comes. You can hear that whistling of the wings. You kind of like that. These golden eyes, you can stand here on the edge of the shore like this. They don't care. They'll come in. You know, it's, it kind of goes against everything you were ever taught about waterfowl hunting and how you should you know, worry about concealment and camouflage and location and, you know, silhouetting and all of that. But it all kind of goes out the window when you're hunting these sea ducks here. Barrels, golden eye. Beautiful birds, full mature. December, Alaska, getting it done. Peter, fetch. If you're gonna pick up a Harlequin in Alaska, that's it. That's, they just don't get any better than that huge mature bird, beautiful colors, blues, just an awesome, amazing species. And for waterfowl hunters here to come up and be able to get an opportunity to harvest one of those, gosh, that bird's gorgeous.
You know, if you're interested in coming to Alaska, I would say contact Alaska Waterfowl Association. Either look us up on the website or check us out on the Facebook page. Contact us. We have a lot of waterfowlers spread out throughout Alaska. We have contacts and leads, and we'll try to do everything we can to help make sure that you have a great trip. That's on a lot of people's bucket list right there. That was, that was a very special hunt, not only for me and Randy, but you know, to be able to take in the scenery, the backdrop, the awe of Alaska. You're in you know, such an amazing place, but yet you have the opportunity to be able to still go out, enjoy it, and harvest some of the most beautiful birds that Alaska can offer. You know, North America, the Harlequin, there's only two places you can hunt those, and that's a bucket list bird for many. And, you know, that day we had the opportunity to harvest some beautiful birds, you know, some beautiful Harlequin, some, you know, some very special golden eyes that day. You know, again, another beautiful bird, and just be able to hold that bird in your hand and look at the feathers on it, look at the colors on it, um, you know, and then think about, you know, being together, sharing the camaraderie of it all. When you pull in, you see the birds in the bay, and you know it's going to be a great day. You just kind of sit back, you smile, and you take it in. But you know that was, um, you know, it was pretty epic. It was a pretty epic day.